So next we have Danielle Lee from MIT. Um, thank you, Danielle. Okay, thank you. Maybe I will eat up those two minutes. We'll see. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, about research that Bob and I have done together that sort of takes a slightly different perspective on these sort of similar issues. So first off, this is something that we you know. If, when an NIH goes in front of Congress and they ask for money, they basically say, you know, you should fund us because we're going to produce research that's going to lead to improvements in health. And when we think about, you know, what is it that leads to improvements in health, people think about things like the drugs that we take, medical devices that we put in our bodies, health behaviors that we have, like, you know, washing our hands, so on and so forth. And so in order to sort of figure out what the returns on NIH money are, like, is this NIH funding worth it, we kind of have to sort of trace its impact into those specific things. And for a large class, sure, um, and for a large class of um, these things that lead to improvements in health, that stuff is brought to market by the private sector. And so what we're trying to do in this work is to assess the um, impact of NIH funding, we need to find a way to sort of trace that um, public sector uh, money as it flows into the private sector. So we're going to try to do two things. The first is to develop some new ways, which Bob and actually already um, talked a lot about, of sort of tracing how publicly funded um, knowledge ends up in the private sector. And the second thing is to kind of understand sort of a counterfactual. Like, what would happen if the NIH did not exist, that public sector funding didn't exist? What would happen then to those private sector products that may or may not draw on NIH funding? Okay. So um, just to start off with sort of the bottom line, the first is that we're going to find strong evidence of spillovers in the sense of NIH-funded stuff going into um, into private sector funding. And this is, so Bhavan talked about kind of looking backwards. You take the drugs and we link them back to the NIH. Here what we're going to do is we're going to take the NIH grants and we're going to link them forward and see how many kind of drugs and patents we hit in that process. So here we're going to find about 30% of NIH grants produce research that's cited by a private sector patent. Um, we should kind of keep in mind, private sector patents, you know, oftentimes they're not drugs. There are they're lottery tickets in the sense that they are patents on compounds that might eventually become a drug, but as we know, many and many of them fail. So we should just kind of keep that in mind as a caveat. The second thing is that it's actually not just the case that if you think about all of NIH, only like one segment of NIH does the stuff that's used by the private sector. In fact, um, we have some work that's trying to figure out, you know, how. Um, can we predict the NIH um, kind of funding that ends up in the private sector? It's actually quite hard. Stuff that's kind of labeled basic science is almost just as likely to um, end up cited in a commercial patent as stuff that's labeled kind of applied. And so those boundaries are actually quite, um, quite porous. And the last thing about these spillovers is that and this sort of captures the nature of basic science. It's actually hard to sort of target. So when the, when the National Cancer Institute funds something and that, those, that research ends up cited in commercial patents, 50% of that stuff is not about cancer. There are large cross-disease spillovers. And so one thing, sort of stepping back, what that means is that when you're trying to use these like, particular bibliometric approaches to try to understand where is the impact of NIH funding or public funding in general, you really have to allow for the possibility that you can't predict well where it's going to have an impact or when it's going to have an impact. If you decide to say, you know, let me look at the impact of NIH funding in cancer on cancer drugs 10 years from now, you're actually going to miss a lot of the potential impact going forward, just as a methodological thing. Okay. The second part of the paper concerns, um, this, our research concerns the notion of what is the counterfactual, what is the causal impact of NIH funding on outcomes? What would happen if that funding went up? What would happen if that funding went down? And here, we're going to find that fewer drugs would be developed in the absence of NIH funding. So if you took the NIH funding away, it's not that Pfizer would just like do the research fully themselves and we would have the same amount of innovation in the end. And so, you know, I will talk a little bit more about the numbers. I'm happy to talk more about it during the Q&A as well. But, you know, if you take some, um, some rough estimates, $10 million in NIH funding, we're going to associate that causally with a net increase about 2.3 more patents. We can try to translate that into a more concrete measure, and we can think about that in terms of the present discounted value of drug sales. So this is the value to the firms, not necessarily the value to sort of the consumers. And depending on which sets of estimates we use, uh, we're going to get something like, you know, 3.5 million on the low end, about 30 million on the high end for the sales, and not including some of the other things, and I'll talk more about that. So these are based on um, two, two papers that we've worked on, so I'm happy to uh, talk about the details, or you're happy to look at those as well. Okay, so um, let me go through this quickly because Pat, um, Bhavan has already done this. We're going to sort of take one kind of very sort of um, simple measure, which is to say we look at NIH grants, 
we look at the publications that acknowledge those grants, and then we're going to look at patents that then cite back to those publications, and we're going to use that to link uh, publicly funded research into the private sector, and these are going to be uh, commercial private sector patents. So we're going to start off on the sample with about 150,000 NIH grants. Um, these are basically all of the ones kind of funded from chartered study sections in core NIH institutes uh, over a 25-year period from 1980 to 2005. And basically, we're going to find that about 43% of these grants produce research that's cited by a private sector patent. Uh, so that's about 60, uh, 66,000 uh, grants. Um, they come, they hit sort of 80,000 unique patents. They come from across the NIH spectrum in terms of institutes and study sections. Um, and that's about 36% of the total life science patents issued during that time. So sort of like a large uh, hit rate. And we can talk a little bit about um, how this kind of varies across different institutes. And so um, on, the, on the y-axis here is sort of the percentage of grants that have a patent associated with Can you hear me now? Okay. So, um, and on the, um, on the x-axis here is sort of as time passes by. So in the first year a grant uh, is given out, nothing has a patent associated with it because no time has passed for that grant to produce research and for that research to be used. And then we kind of go five years out, 10 years out, 15 years out, so on and so forth. And we sort of see this variation uh, by institutes. So allergy and infectious disease, 60%, um, about 20 years out. Um, less so for mental health. This is not a description of whether or not these study section, these institutes are effective or not. This is just, like, it's, it's, I mean, this depends on our, our notion of, you know, what we know about certain diseases at a certain point in time, but just to show that there's, there's variance and it's, it's still quite high across all of the institutes. We can think about this um, in terms of cross of uh, disease areas. So this is what I was mentioning about um, whether or not the sort of the patent that ends up citing this NIH grant is associated with the same disease or a different disease. And you can see that these lines basically line up on top of each other, so you're just as likely to hit something from the same disease as a different disease. And then another thing is you can think about sort of how much time passes between getting a grant and eventually there being a private sector patent associated with that grant and how that's been changing across cohorts. And so this is um, the earlier cohort of things from 1980 to 85. And you can see that as time goes on, that lag is actually getting, uh, getting smaller. So the time it takes for an NIH grant to be associated with patent is shortening over time. And that can reflect um, possibly that what's patentable is moving kind of upstream in terms of earlier stage things, NIH funding kind of moving further downstream into more translational work, um, or maybe perhaps more efficiency in, um, in doing translational work. But, you know, we also, I talked about these are patents, so patents are lottery tickets, and if we then associate, instead of not just any patent, patents associated with advanced stage drug candidates, so those who have hit phase three and beyond, or FDA approved drugs, those numbers that were looking like 50 to 60 percent have gone down now to something like 5 percent. And that's, and that's because very few patents end up being associated with uh, NIH funded drugs, uh, with uh, drugs. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit now about how we think about the counterfactual. What would happen if the NIH uh, decreases budget or increases budget? And part of talking about that is about, is talking about kind of the notion of how we associate patents with the NIH. So I've just shown you things related to like, citation link patents, the explicit links. And these are going to have some advantages. And one of the key advantages is that in basic science or in fundamental science, you don't know where it's going to have its impact. And by using the bibliometric um, history, you can actually trace its impact regardless of where it has its impact. So if a grant gets funded in 1995 in cancer, it has an impact in 1996, you find that. If it has another impact in like 2005, you find that. If it happens in diabetes instead of cancer, you would find that in the, um, in the record. However, it has several disadvantages. So the first is that there's just like underestimates in the sense that right now we're only counting you if you um, are a patent that cites an NIH-funded uh, work. If you're a patent that cites another patent that cites an NIH-funded piece of work that um, is missed, a key part, I think, is actually just has to do with training. All of these scientists that work in pharma firms, they got their training off of NIH grants because their PI like ran that lab out of that money. And all of those effects we're not sort of capturing in this. And that's part, potentially a huge part of how the NIH impacts, um, impacts the private sector through the training of, um, of, of staff scientists. But there's another key thing, which is that 
if we find that an increased NIH funding leads to more patenting by this measure, what I'm strictly showing is that if you fund the NIH more, there's going to be more patents that cite NIH-funded research. And that says NIH-funded research is commercially relevant, which is great. But it doesn't necessarily say that NIH funding leads there to be more innovation on net, because it could just be the case that this is research that firms were going to do anyway. NIH funds it, so it just paying, changes who pays for it, but doesn't change the total amount of, uh, of drugs in the world. And so this notion of crowd out is something that we have to deal with in a different measure. Okay. So what we're going to do is we want to kind of ask the question, if you put more money into a given research area, does that increase the total amount of innovation, NIH funded or not, in that area? So if it's the case that we have crowd out, that this NIH funding just leads to a relabeling, then increases in NIH funding sh shouldn't increase the total amount of innovation in the area. It just increases the total proportion of that innovation that can be then cited back to the NIH. So what we're going to do instead is, um, what we're going to do is we're going to try to like find a way to link um, NIH funding to patents, not just the patents that like cite NIH work, but to the entire universe of stuff in that area. And then we're going to ask, you know, does NIH funding in an area increase the total amount of innovation in that area? So the way we're going to do this is we're going to use the notion of, um, of related publications. And so we're going to define a patent as in the same area as a source of NIH funding if that patent is um, if that patent is similar in a keyword sense to uh, publications that are also directly funded by the NIH, and the way we're going to use that is we're going to use mesh keywords, which are quite detailed and which will think about similarities between topics. And so now, when I look at the um, the left hand side of this equation, instead of thinking about patents citing NIH funded work, I'm thinking about patents that are in the same intellectual area as a given piece of NIH funded work. And we want to look at the relationship between those patents and the amount of NIH funding. And so we're just basically thinking about, you know, what is, um, what is the, say, the correlation between that. Ultimately, we're interested in the causal impact. And so in the paper, we're going to do a lot of things to try to make sure that we're identifying random kind of increases in NIH funding and not things like, you know, there's a war on cancer, we produce more research, um, we put more money into cancer, but private sector firms are also putting more money into cancer. And there's a positive correlation, but it doesn't represent a causal impact. So what we're going to do basically is we're going to ask, like, is this coefficient positive in some sense? Does NIH funding lead to the, an increase in the total amount of innovation in that area? And so what we're going to do is we're going to do this and we're going to control for like a whole bunch of stuff. And basically what that means is that we're going to try to take away the possibility that, you know, more money is going into breast cancer and more drugs are coming out in breast cancer, not because the money is leading to more drugs in breast cancer, but because that's an area in which there's a higher disease burden and everyone's investing more in it relative to other areas, for instance, like, um, um, like deafness, for instance, or you can think about our scientific understanding of different things are, are different, so th we don't not know that much about the genetics of schizophrenia yet, so therefore it's harder to sort of make those impacts come through. We control for a whole bunch of things, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to is isolate kind of the causal impact of NIH funding on total patenting in an area. And so when we run this, there's a whole bunch of we could, where we're increasing controls, increasing controls. Coefficients stay kind of stable, and the way to interpret that is about $10 million of NIH funding leads to 3.3 more patents on net. So this is a total amount of innovation in that area. Um, economists are very concerned about causality, so we do a lot in the paper. It's about 100 pages, once you count the appendices, uh, to isolate the causal impact. And so this estimate, this 2.3, is coming from a specification that's thinking about, you know, in situations where an NIH area kind of randomly seems to get more money because of the pay line variation, what happens in that world. And so that um, estimate comes to 2.3. And now we want to understand how we're trying to change these into kind of dollar terms so that we can kind of tell policymakers a number that they can kind of put their, their uh, grasp around. So there's a lot of different, way, different ways to do this. I'll illustrate one example. Um, one of the things we do is we, um, these results all just, they're all just counting patents. But we might want to count patents associated with advanced stage drugs or specific drugs. And so here what we say is that when we do that, we have find that $10 million leads to 0.034 more patents associated with FDA-approved drugs. You tell that to a congressional staffer, they're not going to fund the NIH because 0.034 looks really low. Uh, it turns out there are about, on average, kind of eight patents um, per FDA-approved drug. And so we say, you know, maybe it's one, it ca contributes as one-eighth. If that patent is fundamentally crucial, then we should count it as one. There's lots of different ways to do this. Um, and then we say, you know, let's take a number for um, 3.47 uh, present discussion 
discounted value of sales. When you multiply these numbers by a number this big, suddenly everything gets large again. And so under this particular specification, you find that $10 million leads to $14.7 million in sales um, returns. Okay, let's see, two minutes. We can do this in a variety of ways. We can think about the number of how much um, NIH funding leads to advanced drug candidates, phase three and beyond, FDA approved drugs, pre-approval patents, so the ones that are more likely to be related to the, um, to the major kind of chemical compounds in the drug, so on and so forth. Each one of these estimates has an implied uh, drug value associated with it, and this ranges from the smallest one is 3.5, and the largest one is about 30. Most of them are somewhere in like the 15 to 20 range. And so if you take that number seriously, it says that NIH funding pays for itself um, using drug sales alone. So this is not counting the training, this is not counting medical devices, this is um, not counting other ways of linking to drugs. And in particular, this is sort of sales referring to sort of private value to firms. We think about the social value to consumers. So, you know, when you take a Tylenol, um, a company gets money from you taking a Tylenol, but you also kind of get utility from the fact that you no longer have a headache. Um, and generally, um, estimates are so of social value returns are higher than estimates of private value returns. Um, it doesn't include benefits from devices and other products. It doesn't include benefits from changes in behavioral um, practice. So we learn that germs are bad, so we should wash our hands, and that saves lives. It's not counted there. Um, but one other thing sort of to keep in mind is that these returns require a certain patience. Uh, it's hard to say I'm going to direct money into this area and get stuff like this, you know, five years out, ten years out. As I showed you in the earlier graphs, I mean, this money kind of ends up in different disease areas. It ends up having impacts three years from now. Sometimes it has impacts 30 years from now. And so it's, you know, I think we, we have, have strong evidence that this money has real concrete uh, impacts. But sort of the downside of that from a kind of congressional perspective is that you can't ask for the specific return tomorrow. Um, and the lags, in fact, can be quite long, so five to 15 years plus. Okay. Um, yeah, I think um, I have 15 seconds left, so I will stop. That's, yeah. <laughs>